Okay, everybody, uh, welcome. My name's Steve Haynes. Um, I'm a body worker. Uh, I use slow, gentle touch and shaking to help people suffer less. Uh, I'm fascinated by bodies and I'm fascinated how far we can take embodiment to heal classic mental health problems of trauma, anxiety, and also not always a mental health problem or not aligned to mental health pain. Um, I used to work in mental health. Uh, I was a failed banker, failed engineer, and I ended up doing uh, working, volunteering with people with learning difficulties. And from that, I started working in mental health for about eight years. And that was really radical for me. I'm a white middle-class boy from uh, Warwickshire, very privileged background, and working with people who were incredibly poor from all sorts of different communities and whose mental health often meant they were in forced medication or in forced stays in hospitals, living off benefits and very, very chaotic lives. And that was a really radical time for me. Um, and I learned a huge amount about how humans function, about how power works and how in that mental health context, how to support people. My career choices at that time were more talking of psychotherapy or, or psychology was interesting for me becoming a manager in the mental health framework. But I got into yoga at that time and I got into massage, shiatsu, chiropractic, cranial sacral therapy, and all those bodywork tools. Uh, and the idea that you can change mental health through bodies uh, developed in my late 20s. And that's been my career path, helping people connect to a body, helping people find safety, and really trying to understand why that is such a powerful way of working why it's not appreciated enough in our culture. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do, basically. Um, one of the things that's really helped me understand the power of embodiment is understanding trauma. And uh, I'm going to explore some rich ideas with you folks tonight. So let's give an outline of the um, talk. So uh, trauma is really strange. Uh, we're going to look at the stress model, actually. Uh, we have some really, really deep insights from the stress model. Uh, and then we're going to look at trauma, some simple versions of trauma, and looking at it a little bit more complex. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have time to introduce the idea of appeasement, which you haven't heard about in a trauma context. It's really, really outstanding. Uh, we're going to come back to some core ideas around dissociation. Um, and how to feel and loss of feeling, loss of connection. So dissociation is the essence of trauma. And then finally, we'll look at the resilience model uh, and just some uh, more hopeful strands that have emerged uh, when looking at uh, exploring and researching trauma. Uh, this is me. I write comic books. Uh, I've done four of them now. There's touch one in addition to three you can see here. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to find out more about how I think, do have a look at the comic books. First up, let's just look at this as a defining principle. So this is life in a very, very basic form. This is a single cellular organism with no brain. Remember that there's no nervous system here, just life exploring. There's no sound on this, but this animal, organism has the ability to contract and wave hairs and move around and it explores. It moves towards things it likes, food, light possibly, and it moves away from things it doesn't like. So this seeking behavior, seeking is a phrase from uh, uh, Jack Pangsep, an emotion researcher. So all life, life for it to function has to be attracted to engage with new sources of stimulus, new sources of information. So an inherent curiosity, inherent restlessness, an inherent moving towards things that are novel and exciting is a feature of life, even at this single cellular organism level. And the opposite of this is we contract and move away. So um, let's call contracting and moving away fear and moving towards as being playful. Okay, so uh, let's go into the first one, learning from the stress model. 
Well, this is a phenomenal piece of dissection um, showing all the blood vessels inside of our body. It's just amazing, isn't it? We, everything else apart from blood vessels has been removed. Um, and we have an incredible thousands and thousands of miles of blood vessels. In fact, we have so many blood vessels that we can only fill five to 10% of our capillary beds at any one time. Moving your blood around is a really primary function of the stress response. So blood, diverting it in a stress response, when we're activated, we divert our blood to our brain, our liver, our heart, and our big muscles. We want to think quickly, breathe quickly, pump lots of blood around, and we want to contract our big muscles so that we can uh, do fast action. Uh, blood flow is really, really uh, sensitive to our stress response. Here's a model of uh, vessels and, and um, going into capillary beds. We have this muscular band around our arteries and contraction of this muscular band is controlled by something called the sympathetic nervous system. This is part of your autonomic nervous system that speeds you up as a survival gesture. And part of what it does is it diverts the blood to those regions, the big muscles I've just talked about. And it also mobilizes all our sugar reserves. Another part of the uh, autonomic nervous system and the speedy stress response is activating our hormone system. So here you can see a nice uh, image, I hope, of the glands, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland inside the brain, our thyroid, our adrenals, our pancreas, our, and our gonads, our re reproductive uh, glands. These are also all exquisitely sensitive to the perception of danger and threat and are absolutely activated in a stress response. Let's look, we'll look a little bit later on at the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis as a main player in stress. If you ever read about stress, you'll come across Hans Sale. Hans Sale uh, in the 1950s came up with a very, very influential model that stayed around. Adaptability and resistance to stress are fundamental prerequisites for life, and every vital organ and function participates in them. So stress changes every system in our body. And it's happening all the time, not just in emergencies. This is an amazing um, uh, review paper of stress. And it's just summarizing current understanding. We have come to appreciate that stress biology is not simply an emergency system, but rather an ongoing process. The body and brain adapt to our daily experiences, whether we call them stressful or not. So we have these systems running all the time in the background and they learn. Here's an example of learning in a negative bias. Childhood trauma appears to be a potent risk factor for chronic fatigue syndrome. Evidence from developmental neuroscience suggests that early experience programs the development of regulatory systems are implicated in the pathophysiology of chronic fatigue, including the HPA axis. So this is one strand of research. There's lots of others, but chronic defeat fatigue uh, depends on early learning in this model. We get stressed, we stay stressed, and our stress systems, including the hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal axon, seems to be working in a heightened, reactive, uh, uh, non-optimal way. So I've talked about the sympathetic nervous system and the HBA, a mix of glands and nervous system designed to speed us up. Let's look at that. This is the sympathetic nerves. Here's our brain, the brain, uh, the spinal cord, and emerging from the spinal cord, we have a whole bunch of nerves, beautifully complex, that are innovating glands. You can see the salivary glands here. Um, they're innovating the adrenals. Look at this pathway, boom, boom, boom. We're gonna look at this in more detail, the adrenal pathway and going to our gonads, uh, but to all our organs, the, the regulation of sugar. When we're in a stress response, we communicate with the liver to release sugar. We switch off our digestion and we're pumping out lots of chemicals such as adrenaline and cortisol 
to speed up the body. So the stress response is initiated and regulated by our sympathetics and our HPA axis. Let's remember this nervous connection to a gland, right into the heart of a gland. Here's some detail of that. The quick way that we respond to stress is we switch on our sympathetics. They send a direct nervous signal right into the middle of the adrenals and they pump out lots of adrenaline. This is called the SAM system or the sympathetic adrenal medullary system. This is direct neural activation of a gland secreting, dumping loads of adrenaline to, into the body. Parallel to that, we have the HPA axis. The hypothalamus, part of the threat detection system, sends a chemical factor to the pituitary, which sends a signal through the blood to the adrenal cortex, not the adrenal medulla, medulla a different part of the adrenals, this takes a few minutes because it's coming through the blood and then we start pumping out cortisol. Cortisol is the big brother of adrenaline. Cortisol is something you can keep producing for a whole lifetime. And it was implicated in that research earlier about abnormal cortisol levels and abnormal regulation of this system uh, leads to chronic fatigue. So these very, very important sympathetic nervous systems working with the hormone systems changing every system in our body. If we chronically activate this system, we have all sorts of dysfunction. This is Robert Sapolsky. He's excellent on stress. He's really generous with his knowledge and one of the primary researchers around stress and cortisol. And just reinforcing, stress is associated with dysfunction of the HPA axis and cortisol levels. He did lots of primary research on baboons, fabulous stuff. And it's very clear evidence that upsetting the system upsets rhythms in the bodies, upset, um, it kind of, you're pushing things to the max all the time. I love this model. This is from Robert Sapolsky. We can be balanced in stress, but it's like having two elephants on a seesaw. We've got massive uh, cortisol and sympathetic activity, we need to work really, really hard with our parasympathetics, the opposite, the slowing down rest and digest function. We can do this, but we're wearing the system out. We're pushing things really hard. So you might think that people are working really hard in their whole life. They're pushing the system really life. They are trying to recover. Uh, but when they, uh, at some stage, their whole system collapses because they've just been pushing the whole thing too hard too fast. And also when we're in this chronically stressed state, um, the system's unstable. So one elephant gets off the seesaw and it all goes a bit crazy. So yeah, it's an inherently unstable system that's being pushed really, really hard. It's like a fast car. It can go fast, it can do lots of things, but you're just going to kind of wear it out and it'll do a catastrophic collapse at some stage. So I like that an understanding of stress. Everybody has a kind of understanding that uh, too much stress is not a good thing. I just want to say this is gold dust, really clear clinical evidence and review papers from the 19, uh, from 2020, just reinforce the understanding that stress is a major uh, health determinant for human beings. We need stress, good stress. Stress is productive, but if we don't recover and we, um, we feel forced to do things rather than choosing to do things. We have very, very different outcomes, very poor health, very poor health outcomes. However, there's an amazing blind spot in the stress literature. One of those papers, the one from 2020, that was this massive 20 page review of stress. It didn't mention dissociation at all. I think dissociation is one of the key defining factors of trauma. So we're going to look at what traumatic stress is and to differentiate it from just the speeding up response that I've just described. So trauma, uh, simple and complex. Let's just go through these three statements. I use them quite a lot. I really like them. So there is trauma, terrible things happen to human beings. We can overcome trauma. Trauma is healed by meeting the body. So 
stress can become toxic stress, overwhelming stress, catastrophic stress, the idea that the load gets so much that we collapse. So stress and trauma are absolutely on a continuum. But we might define trauma as having something extra, which is this dissociative element. Instead of speeding up to survive, in trauma, there's this extra feature of collapsing to survive. We play dead, we switch off, we disappear as a survival gesture. This is a very, very different response to speeding up. And it's absolutely one of the things that happens when we experience the threat as um, inescapable threat. We'll look at we can overcome trauma as a statement later, and we'll look at meeting the body and feeling things a little bit later. But let's look at some definitions of trauma. Um, a very simple one to hold on to is that trauma is anything that overwhelms our ability to cope. I really like that. I think it's very flexible and very open. Another nice definition is trauma is being stuck in protective reflexes. I'm stuck speeding up to survive and I'm and or I'm stuck collapsing as a survival gesture. So please hold on. Those are my simple definitions. Trauma is anything that overwhelms our ability to cope and trauma is being stuck in protective reflexes of fight or flight or being stuck in a protective reflex of freeze. However, we should really acknowledge the complex uh, uh, and more technical definitions of trauma. So in the 1980s, the American Diagnostic Manual for Psychiatry came up with something called post-traumatic stress disorder. This was based on Vietnam veterans, previous re-looking at the data from the world wars and women who'd experienced sexual violence. It's become a very, very common term, PTSD. So after overwhelming events, PTSD includes trauma intrusions such as flashbacks and nightmares, avoidance of memories. It might be the more dissociative collapsing response as part of that. Emotional and cognitive changes. My emotions are different. Persistent negative emotions and beliefs about the world like uh, everybody's scary rather than the person who attacked me was scary. Uh, we think differently. We become quite linear. I've got to do this and I've got to do it now. I've got so much activity and speed going on in my body. It's very, very hard for me to step outside of my own process, appreciate the viewpoint of other people. So our thinking becomes quite rigid, quite fixed. Um, and then we have hypervigilance, our changes in arousal and reactivity. So these are a really nice, uh, well, nice, um, clear, let's say, collection of symptoms in a more technical definition of what PTSD is. There's also another definition of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is where there's lots of traumas upon traumas and often occurring and developmental landmarks uh, for children. And this involves difficulties relating to our sense of self-concept, our emotional development and thinking and interpersonal functioning. So all our social functioning and all our learning is colored by early experiences and many layers of trauma, and it leads to multiple complex health outcomes. So we can have childhood developmental complex trauma that, uh, Adults who were well-regulated and re relatively happy childhoods, um, you get all those symptoms of PTSD. But for children growing up in unsafe circumstances, there's more complex range of personality types and uh, a wider range of issues. So yeah, just some definitions of trauma. A lot of the research was done on war veterans and was done on people who'd experience uh, sexual uh, attacks. But uh, the devastating understanding in the 80s and 90s was of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, childhood abuse became a kind of known about and described phenomena, but also just this understanding that for every person who's been in a war zone, there's 10 children who've been in adverse childhood experiences. 
let's just acknowledge that. This is a really wonderful TED talk that reignited some very powerful research around adverse childhood experiences. Adverse childhood experiences are a list of 10 things, uh, such as a parent who was alcoholic, a parent who was abusive, uh, growing up with a parent uh, without, uh, without parents. If you have any one of those things, or you have any one of these 10 things, you have an A, you know, your A score increases incrementally. So this is a, a very reputable study, but it's been carried out over 20, 30 years, and Nadine Burke Harris repopularized it. Um, so all sorts of data emerges from this study, but let's say one in eight people have four or more ACEs. That's really, really high. Uh, they have all sorts of risk of chronic pulmonary obstructive disease, for example, two and a half times that of some with an A score of zero. And their mental health also suffers four and a half times more likely to be depressed. Basically, the higher the ACEs you have, the more likely you are to get uh, chronic health problems, not just physical health problems, stressing that whole um, activating that whole stress system we talked about earlier on, but also it affects every level of functioning, not least your ability to think and emote. And remember, all of that gets deeply, deeply confused uh, by these two gestures of speeding up to survive and collapsing to survive. So there is trauma. Uh, this is a really, really important modern understanding of, of how we are affected by overwhelming events. Good. I'm gonna look, at, so we've looked at a stress model, which is neurobiology and understanding of what's happening inside of the nervous system and inside the body. We've looked at some causes of trauma, or descriptions of trauma, all these symptoms, and a lot of these things affect the body and the mind. So a lot of the diagnostic manual is talking about not being able to sleep. And this research from the A study shows us that we can relate all sorts of chronic health problems back to being overwhelmed and uh, non-optimum stress responses. So that strand of psychology, the strand of uh, neurobiology is very rich and it helps us understand trauma and uh, the traditions from psychiatry and animal research have helped us understand that. There's another strand of research from looking at ethology and communities of animals that's very, very interesting. And I'm gonna frame that as appeasement responses in social hierarchies. And I think it's incredibly rich for us uh, to understand how sensitive human beings are to social context and power dynamics. So we're going to look at the appeasement model. So first up, here's uh, some dogs uh, just demonstrating a dominant dog and a submissive dog. So here, the black dog is the, clearly the dominant dog. It growls and asserts its uh, dominance. And these younger dogs are submissive. But you get growled at, and what you do is you're actually nicer to the dog that was aggressive to you. And here, I'm completely submissive to the point that you can sniff my genitals. Amazing. As it says at the start, a masterclass in submissive behavior. So this is behavior that's well known in hierarchical uh, societies of uh, lots of different animals. Yeah? But let's just think about that. If I'm aggressive to you, the response of this dog is to... Oh, please, they gotta be... Um, the response, as we just saw in that video, was to actually touch, lick, fawn to the aggressive dog not move away and disappear i have to exist in a social hierarchy i need you to pay attention to me you've kind of shown me aggression i have to be nice to you as a response to your aggression that's incredible as a social response 
Here's another example of this that's really quite phenomenal. On the left, we have an older monkey. You're going to see her. She's done all the work of collecting the food. She literally has a baby on her breast. And the monkey on the right is a young monkey, but it's a high status monkey. The commentary should explain as it goes along. She is highborn. Others have been feasting on berries, but she's arrived too late on the scene to get any. All the berries are stashed away in the cheek pouches of others. Imelda spots Poppin. She's far larger and older than Imelda, but she is from a lower ranking family, and that entitles Imelda to take anything of Poppins that she wants, including the food right out of her mouth. Poppin makes it as hard for Imelda as she dare, but if she resists too strongly, she risks a beating from the rest of the troop. Gosh, so that's quite incredible, I think. Um, the bigger, older monkey with a baby has done all the work to collect the food, and the, low, the high status monkey can literally take the food out of its mouth. So, why does that happen? Because, because we need to exist in social groups. Its role in its society means it uh, to exist in the larger community and all the benefits of that means it has to do this appeasement fawning behavior. It has to do what the dominant uh, hierarchy requires it to do. So gosh, when we start thinking about th this explains all sorts of human behaviors that are very counterintuitive at first glance. The biggest threat to human beings is actually other human beings. Our status in social hierarchies is life and death. It's deeply, deeply, fundamentally important to us. Bullying, your position at work, all these things being accepted by your peers, all of these things are incredibly stressful for us. They are things that we spend huge resources negotiating. So here's some researchers are down this. Fran de Waal, this is he's a lovely primate researcher. He's one of the people who learned that when monkeys attached, attacked each other, he expected them to be a farther apart. They actually touched each other more after the attacking. So deference is the typical attitude of the member of a hierarchical species in the presence of a potentially annoyed dominant, a mixture of submission and appeasement that serves to reduce the likelihood of attack. You've been mean to me, I have to smile, laugh, fawn, pay more attention on you to make sure that you're not gonna attack me again. Incredible. Uh, this is Dacha Keltner, an emotion researcher talking about appeasement. The potential and actual conflicts that punctuate social living, we believe have acted as selection pressures that have led humans and other social species to develop in the course of evolution, a family of appeasement and reconciliation processes. So Keltner's offering very clearly that this happens in human beings too. We really need to negotiate power and understanding of where power lies and our responses to power is deeply, deeply useful for human beings uh, and but also incredibly stressful. Um, some ways that this acts out in the larger culture of our life. Uh, well, uh, there's an incredible literature on this in the uh, domestic violence and uh, the relationships, violence against uh, women and girls. So Helena Kennedy, she's a QC, some really great stuff in the law around this, but battered women have to seem meek and subservient to have our sympathy. So in our culture, uh, women need, uh, God, have been socialized to take certain roles. And uh, uh, if they step outside of that role, they get judged harshly. Gosh, that's hard to understand, isn't it? Uh, here's a, a kind of a 
a mayor in, in Japan talking, women in Japan are crushed, says the councillor, ousted after alleging sexual assault. So the larger cultural framework is that the power structures don't believe the, the people who start challenging those hierarchies. So gosh, yeah, uh, violence against women and girls and the roles of traditional roles um, really uh, demonstrate this whole family and consequences of uh, there is power and it needs to be negotiated. And if you don't have power, then the powerful group will crush you, will make you be the person who's perceived as being wrong. This also plays out in the dynamics of race. So any group that is perceived of as less, um, is as other than, is less than, has to negotiate with the dominant power hierarchy. In, um, these are two young men uh, in the UK talking about being stopped and searched over a lifetime. One of them was stopped 29 times, one of them was stopped uh, in the 30s. So it's so offensive to be called aggressive when you are not being aggressive. My skin color and hair to a white police officer seem aggressive. And here's this quote, you have to swallow your pride, bite your tongue and not say anything. If you have to keep laughing, even though you're incredibly angry, you have to suppress your response to show deference to the uh, hierarchical structure. This has huge consequences. Again, really, really great research around this. This is a 25 year study uh, that racism literally ages black Americans faster. So the experience of constant and accumulating stress, there's that word, this is how we, this is the physiology that we understand gets activated due to power imbalances. The experience of constant and accumulating stress due to racism throughout an individual's lifetime can wear and tear down the body, literally getting under the skin to affect health. This is a very, very good study demonstrating clear adverse health effects to this constant stress of living in an unequal and unjust society. So I, I, I mean, the appeasement model is so powerful to understand that it's not just war zones, it's not just childhood events, it's not just car accidents and uh, natural disasters. Uh, one of the biggest things we negotiate is the power dynamics and unjust uh, relationships that exist in our culture. We're going to go back to dissociation is the essence of trauma. Because I think understanding dissociation is one of our primary roots of treating and coming out of trauma. I think it's the hidden mystery of trauma. So dissociation disorders are nearly as common as depression. So why haven't we heard about them? So everybody knows about fight or flight, not enough people know about dissociation. This study looking at students and also doing meta reviews of dissociative disorder. So people doing, filling some psychiatric questionnaires and being assessed on a dissociative disorder scale discovered 11% of college students meet the criteria for dissociative disorder. That's as common as depression. Everybody knows about depression. Everybody knows about fight and flight. Not enough people know about dissociation as an underlying feature of stress, traumatic stress, and uh, a primary defense reaction to um, uh, the perception of threat. So there is dissociation and it's not well known enough about. Dissociation is a gesture of collapse and withdrawal. It's a passive response. So instead of going fight and flight and freeze, I'm contracting on, and going into a passive collapsed response. Here's a mouse, there's a cat that's kind of brought it in, the eyes are closed, the legs are stiff. It's completely switched off as a survival gesture. What's the value of this survival gesture? Uh, here's uh, this video, there's the animal survive. So we'll just see uh, a cheetah and a gazelle.
good. So I hope that was useful and not too activating, but that gazelle survived by playing dead. That's the freeze response. So I prefer the term immobilizing if I want to be really clean around the language. But um, I'm going to say fight or flight as I called it the stress response or mobilizing, speeding up to survive. And I say a separate, different response of freezing, dissociating, immobilizing, playing dead as a survival gesture. I loosely call that dissociation most of the time when I talk about it, but the cleanest language is it's an immobilizing response. Sometimes we go stiff and tonic immobility, or sometimes we go collapsed and floppy immobility. But freeze is essentially filling our spinal cord with endorphins. These are natural painkillers. They mask sensation. They prevent us from feeling, uh, from feeling, often feeling pain or feeling anything, just knowing what we're doing. We're not going to feel the pain of death. Uh, and often, sometimes, confusingly, horribly, it can be um, quite numbing, a loss of contact with reality. And sometimes, confusingly, that can feel amazing. So I'm full of endorphins. I'm not bounded by my limiting body. And I'm floating away and I'm very, very disconnected. So that's the hard part around dissociation is sometimes it feels fantastic. And that makes it one of the hardest things to work with in trauma. People don't know that they don't know. I used to practice dissociating as a kid. I used to go to the psychedelic kind of state in bed and make, make the whole world go a bit weird. I used to love it. it. Took me ages to unwind that as an adult. So, yeah, and uh, if we're not careful, a lot of uh, spiritual bypassing or journeys of meditative journeys actually are leaving the body and promoting dissociation rather than connecting to the body and being more grounded. So, yeah, dissociation is the essence of trauma. I'll look at the origin of that quote. And leaving the body is something we should be very, very, very careful of. But there's a value in dissociation, this collapsing, playing dead, has been honed by evolution because it fools predators uh, uh, into moving on, as we saw with the uh, cheetah and the gazelle. Here's a very famous picture of a soldier uh, who's in a dissociative response. This is hours or after the threat has passed, but he's clutching his gun, looking into the ca uh, looking away from the camera, fixed stare. Uh, the photographer said he didn't move for many minutes when he took the photo. He's not in the present moment. His physiology is collapsed. He uh, can't move his face muscles, can't focus on the present moment. Uh, his heartbeat will be different and his posture is very different. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a baby that's showing the same signs of dissociation um that was a tough birth i think within a this is within a few minutes of birth or very soon after birth there's a same fixed staring eyes the tension in the jaw and there's a t an intensity we can see in that experience i think that's very similar to this sort of thousand mile stare so we've looked at adverse childhood experiences we also need to acknowledge that birth can be a shaping and priming of our nervous system uh, those quiet babies can be dissociated babies or babies can be activated and come out kicking and screaming and be primed to always going a little bit quicker than they might need to. So early life events, uh, all those birth stuff and early attachment processes aren't really covered by the ACE study. Uh, as rich and as amazing as the ACE study is, we do need to include birth as a, as a, a priming for our uh, stress responses and dissociative tendencies. Here's that baby again, and just here's the opposite, reaching out, engaging, um, a kind of ease. And you can see this, not just in the facial expression and the variety and nuance of movement, but you'll see that in how people breathe, how they move. Remember, every system in the body has to change uh, to adapt to stress. Uh, here's a kind of summary of where we've been going so far. If your physiology is stuck, you are stuck. The psychology of trauma is complex. The meanings we make, the stories and attempts to make sense of what's happening is irreducibly complex. However, at its heart, trauma is relatively simple. There's simple physiological gestures happening of 
fight or flight or freeze. My protective reflexes of the brain are fixed in defense cascades, changing our activity in the body to gear towards fight or flight or freeze. I really, really would offer that as a, a very simple paradigm to work with when you're working as a body worker, when you're interacting with other people, if you're a talking treatment therapist. Try and work out this person's speeding quick, the, piece of, the person's talking more quickly. They've got a riot of ideas. The emotions are getting a little bit faster, a little bit more intense. Their breathing speeding up. Their gestures are quicker. They're going into a speed response. And they might have churning guts, tight hearts, slightly sweaty. All sorts of things are speeding up. They're going into that fight or flight. If you can help people slow down at that point, that's an amazing break on an emerging stress response. And if we can do it for ourselves, notice I'm beginning to speed up to survive. Then noticing that and learning to slow down at that point is a very, very powerful tool for breaking this defense cascade. Similarly, the gestures of uh, freezing. I'm feeling a little bit sleepy. I feel as though I wanna get out of here. I feel as though I'm collapsed and I can't move. I'm beginning to go a bit numb, sometimes tingly, you just get weird sensations in your body. I feel a bit dreamy. All of these things, if we can notice that urge to disappear, the slowing down, and we can learn to regulate that. The first step is believing it's important. Second step is noticing when it's happening and then learning to interact with that. Then again, I'm offering this is a very, very powerful route to putting a break on your defense cascades that if you, uh, if you don't regulate them, will speed up and catastrophize and take over. So Essel van der Kolk is the origin of this phrase, dissociation is the essence of trauma. The opposite of this though also emerges from van der Kolk's work. Grounded means that you can feel your butt in your chair, see the light coming through the window, feel the tension in your calves and hear the wind stirring in the tree outside. This is a very beautiful version of being present, being grounded, being connected to your body and connected to the environment. So if dissociation is the essence of trauma, the opposite is the route to coming out of that. Connect to your body, connect to your feelings, connect to the people around you, connect to the environment around you. That will regulate and switch off the speed gesture or the disappearing, disconnecting gesture. Let's keep looking at dissociation. These are a couple of tough quotes, I'm afraid, but... Um, very illustrative. So this is a woman uh, who experienced a sexual assault and just the incredibleness of the, her protective reflex of dissociation. I was also aware that I had floated out of my body, was on top of the wardrobe watching what was happening to me down below. This is a very, very common theme actually from people who are attacked, the sense of being outside of the body. Uh, here's James Rhodes. He's an amazing person. This is a really brutal book, but a really fabulous book on his journey and understanding of trauma. Uh, he was sexually abused from five to 10, became an amazing pianist. A really lovely, very powerful book. The most serious and long lasting of all the symptoms of abuse was dissociation. Ever since then, like a Pavlov puppy, the minute a feeling or situation even threatens to become overwhelming, I'm no longer there. So these are quite extreme descriptions of what happens. Um, and if that's your experience, my heart goes out to you, but do know that we can learn to slowly spot the early warning signs of drifting away. In safe therapeutic relationships, in safe circumstances, in communities, we can begin to feel this role of connection and with help and skill and practice, we can learn to spot the ones and twos and threes of an emerging speed response or an emerging uh, dissociative response. Uh, and here's this confusion around the dissociation feeling again from James Rhodes. So I leave my body floating out of it and up to the ceiling where I watch myself, it becomes too much even from there. And then I fly out of the room straight to the closed doors and off to safety. It was an inexplicably brilliant feeling. 
So yeah, dissociation can feel incredible and that's really hard. It's frequently mistaken for transcendental experiences of spiritual growth. And uh, meditative experiences, yoga experiences, uh, times when we leave our body and think that that's a useful thing, we need to be really, really careful of those because the fact that it feels good is not necessarily predictive that it's beneficial to you. Right? And that's just hard. Uh, dissociation is really, really confusing. And let's just finish. Uh, Levine is a major, major figure in trauma. The immobility or freezing response is the single most important factor in uncovering the mystery of human trauma. So, uh, yeah, dissociation, immobilizing, if we can spot it, understand it, it really, for me, is absolutely the key to starting to change this experience uh, of being overwhelmed and stuck in defense cascades. Uh, would I say that PTSD is a mental health issue or a physical ailment? It's both. The whole person is involved. So it's not really great to separate out bodies and minds at this level. It's really better to function at the level of a person and a person is stuck uh, and it has consequences for every system and all experiences of physicality, consciousness, emotion, everything's involved. So people get stuck, not just minds, not just bodies, people get stuck. Good. I'll come back to those questions. So I'm going to keep going with the lecture. So I'm going to talk about resilience for another five, ten minutes. That will take us to an hour. Then I'm going to pause for some questions. And then the last 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about touch and cranial work. So yeah, just remember, we did learning from the stress model. We did trauma, simple and complex. So a simple version, anything that overwhelms us, being stuck in fight and flight, being stuck and freeze. And we looked at some complexities, um, childhood events. And we also looked at the complexity of the appeasement response. I've gone back to dissociation as the essence of trauma. I hope you've got a flavor of that. Let's look at resilience now to complete and hopefully draw out some tools and things that you can do. So resilience. Well, first up, I'm very influenced by David Baselli. I teach TRE and shaking as a way of working with trauma. This is a beautiful quote from David. The human animal is designed to experience, endure, survive and learn from traumatic episodes. If we did not possess this ability, the human species would have become extinct. So yes, we do have these protective reflexes and yes, we can get stuck in them, but also we thrived and grew in response to trauma. We didn't just endure, we actually got better and learned from our experiences. We had saber tooth tigers, unexplained famines, a world that was incredibly new and didn't really make sense. And we didn't just survive, we thrived as a, we thrived as a species. So we have natural mechanisms to activate stress responses, but we also have beautiful, simple ways and tools to switch them off. So uh, this is a really great, I'm only about halfway through it, but I think it's an outstanding book. I think it's going to become one of my, uh, you know, one of the books I recommend around trauma. So he's summarizing the development of trauma and looking at modern research. And out of this, this resilience trajectory, he calls it, turns out to be very, very common, beautiful, beautiful understanding across all of these different studies. So he looked at all sorts of studies, natural disasters, sexual and physical assault, soldiers in war, mass shootings, life-threatening medical events such as cancer diagnosis, heart disease. The resilience trajectory was always the most common outcome occurring on average in about two thirds of participants. So the, he talks about three trajectories in response to trauma. The resilience trajectory is the most common one. Two thirds of people uh, cope, find meaning in what's happened and aren't uh, irre irreparably damaged or changed by what's happened to them. They roll with it, they learn from it and they move on in two thirds of the time in all these things that he studied. That's just incredible 
understanding and emerge from researching um, long-term studies, how do people respond to trauma? Well, actually, most of the time, humans recover and they recover pretty well. Uh, so that's two thirds to what he calls the uh, resilience trajectory. Uh, there's a group of people who uh, it's hard and it takes six months before they're back on the feet or beginning to change. So, but they're still on a recovery trajectory, he says. And then I think uh, it varies, but five, 10% can get stuck in this um, uh, non-recovery trajectory. So they stay in heightened, chronically stressed or chronically dissociated states. But the big takeaway from this is human beings recover two thirds of the time, whatever we throw at them. So really good to know that trauma is not a life sentence. You have tools within you to recover. So what are those tools? Well, we've looked at community as a problem and power structures as a problem. However, uh, Bell Hook, she's an amazing activist. Uh, she died, unfortunately, fairly recently um, from all sorts of perspectives, uh, race, queerness, uh, just amazing. Uh, rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of community. So finding a com act of communion, I'm sorry. Uh, so finding safe others, safe relationships, safe people, safe communities is often really, really important. If power dynamics are central to us feeling unsafe, finding communities where we feel accepted, valued, communities where we can uh, feel that we have success and meaning is really, really important. One of the nice things about humans is we exist in multiple communities. We may be having a terrible time at work, but our volunteer work or our running of the social club or our managing of the, the football team at the weekend, we have status in that community. We feel valued in those communities and that can counterbalance all the uh, other negative experiences we have that we feel stuck in around work. So yeah, human beings as rich social lives really start cultivating those spaces where you feel valued and find communities with shared values and uh, supportive places. So I think that's, uh, uh, yeah, communities can help heal trauma. Uh, here's Enkem Enfado. Uh, she's a friend and uh, we used to do TRE together. She's moved on to do her own stuff, Lumos Transforms. I have huge respect for NKEM. Uh, she's one of the people who helped me understand appeasement. Uh, she brings in a sort of social change agenda here. And I think that's really important. I work in one-to-one -one therapies and um, I'm frequently about personal change and individual change. But uh, here's, let's follow the quote from uh, NKEM. Appeasement occurs in a social power hierarchy. The appeaser is damned if they express sympathetic activation because the hierarchy will punish them in one way or another. And they are damned if they don't because the state of appeasing is metabolically taxing and spirit crushing. If the appeaser regulates their stress response, the power hierarchy is unchanged. So that's quite a wake up call for people doing personal therapies, I would offer. The cure for appeasement is dismantling power structures and no amount of nervous system regulation will do that. So we're seeing much more about uh, how we need to have systemic change. And I really need to learn this as me as an individual therapist working with one-to-one uh, -one people, but just really appreciating this, that unequal power dynamics are going to limit the ability of my clients to get well. So yeah, maybe appreciate that individuals are held in power structures and this uh, uh, if we don't change the power structures, then um, we're just making ourselves resilient to things that are unfair. Hmm. I feel that as quite a wake up call, really. Let's look at some other strategies. Another few minutes before I pause and move on. So if our bodies disappear, then not feeling is a problem. Uh, some of the most devastating medical and public health problems of our time, depression, substance addiction, and intractable pain are centered on pathologies of feeling. So if we get better at feeling, getting better at connecting to our body, then we can regulate 
and change the uh, course of all these stress responses. This is hard. We have to meet a vis visceral, messy, difficult body. But Van der Kolk offers, you can only be fully in charge of your life. You can, only be you can be fully in charge of your life only if you acknowledge the reality of your body in all its visceral dimensions. I'm a body worker. I privilege embodied ways of working. We can regulate our heart rate, switch on our gut, feel connected to our body, find agency through moving and feeling, shaking, engaging uh, powerfully with our body. Trauma is not just a problem of the mind. Trauma affects every system in our body, and we can do a bottom-up approach to reboot our physiology, and we will think more clearly, emote more clearly, remember more clearly when we regulate our body, when we switch off fight or flight, when we switch off freeze. So feeling is really important. Feeling safe is the essence of overcoming trauma finding safe communities, finding safe movements, finding footholds into bodies that are difficult, messy, and visceral. Sometimes we need support to start cultivating uh, slow, gentle, safe qualities inside of us. And if that feels really alien and really hard, get some support to do that. You know, I like cranial psychotherapy. I like uh, any good therapy, though, that helps us connect to our body. I teach shaking and slow, gentle, relational touch. But anything that helps you find a foothold and helps you begin to feel safe inside of your body is going to help you feel safe in relationships, safe with other people, and safe in a world that's frequently scary. Good. Let's finish with uh, Maya Angelou. So she was someone who experienced racism, sexual assault, rape as a child, and she just became this incredible beacon of hope for many, many people. So however, whatever's happened to you, however difficult the story, know that two thirds of human beings and do go through resilience. And her, I hope some inspiration from Maya Angelou. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Maya Angelou, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Good luck in finding those safe spaces. Good luck in connecting to your body and beginning to cultivate agency, connection, warmth, joy, and ease inside of you. Um, this sense of connection is absolutely teachable. If you understand that you're not mad, bad, or broken, some of the responses of speeding up to survive or disconnecting, disappearing to survive, if you understand them as protective reflexes, you begin to have power over them. You can begin to negotiate with them on your own, in safe communities, with skilled therapists, and find that sense of joy and connection to your body. Um, yeah, well, good luck with that. Um, I hope the talk has made sense and was useful to you. I'm gonna make a pause now and just uh, collect some questions and uh, yeah, see where we go. Let me just read through a little bit of the chat and uh, I'll try and look at some of the, the questions that are coming up. Uh, gosh, there's lots. So Claire, is it possible then to balance our parasympathetics and sympathetics? Yes, uh, yeah, we can learn to go a bit slower. We can learn to feel a bit more and include more in our feeling states. So learning to breathe, learning to move, learning to connect to people, um, slow movement practices, all sorts of things will help you uh, regulate uh, your feeling states. And it always involves change in the parasympathetics, the sympathetics and the hormone systems. To be sensitive is to have these systems working to protect you sometimes. We can learn to get good at stress or we can learn to get good at love and joy and ease and relaxing. 
Yeah, and not, uh, I'm told not to get stuck when I start to get overwhelmed, but I can't help it. Can't breathe and I'm so overwhelmed. Yeah, I, I, yeah. If, at that moment, when those threat detections kick in, if they kick in fast, it can feel really panicky. We can feel really stuck. If it's hard to do it on your own, first up, know that it is negotiable, but you might need community and support and try some different things. Remember our single cellular organism at the start. It has two gestures, moving towards, moving away. If we're stuck in a contraction reflex, I'm going to offer that um, the opposite of fear and contraction is the ability to play. So being creative, you may have tried some different things and they haven't quite worked yet. But the hopeful thing I'm offering is that if we keep playing, playing is the opposite of fear. And if we can get support to play, explore, be curious, and often we need a guide or new tools, just uh, keep trying different things. And at some stage, you'll find a route into unsticking your physiology is my hope, my expectation, the kind of model I work from. Uh, the vagus nerve, can I explain the connection between touch, touch motion and polyvagal theory? Well, I, I could give it a go, but not right now. But yes, yeah, so I talked about the sympathetics and the parasympathetics. Uh, the parasympathetics, the main nerve is the vagus nerve and feeling threatened will change the activity in your vagus nerve. Ooh. Um, do you think a child who experiences nearly death at the age of six can keep the consequences of it even if the childhood was a good one with a lovely family? Uh, it may be that a near-death experience as a child defines that person uh, horribly, uh, but it may be that the love and connection means they're resilient and they go through that um, uh, resilience trajectory. So just because there's no automaticity, no linear response between an event and how we respond. So even something really, really horrible People can be well-regulated, they can recover. And the research from Banana says that two thirds of the time that happens, people recover and are resilient in response to even the worst types of traumas that we can think. So yeah, don't assume that because someone has a difficult event and they don't talk about it is because they're repressed and they don't know what's going on. They may have just recovered and that is the normal response if we follow Banana. No, Jody, do the statistics on resilience trajectory apply to repetitive ongoing trauma or only to single event traumas? No, he has a whole range of stuff in there. I haven't seen how he relates it to the ACEs study. Um, I, I don't know, actually, Jody, uh, but he studied a lot of types of trauma and some of those will involve repetitive uh, events. But uh, to be honest, I don't know in answer to your question. I'm going to move on a little bit. Uh, and just talk about uh, some tools that I use specifically when working with uh, humans. So, uh, so I'm a body worker, uh, and I try to be a trauma-informed body worker. Um, I think that's been really, it's a great phrase, being trauma-informed. Uh, what that means for me, particularly in my work, is understanding appeasement is important. My clients may be saying yes, because uh, they perceive me as powerful or someone who knows what's going on. So I spend a lot of time before I touch people negotiating what safety is. So I work in a paradigm that I think is inherently gentle um, of uh, cranial sacral therapy, relational touch. Some of the features of that are that we don't poke, prod, push. We just listen with our hands and try and create a sense of safety in relationship. But even before I put my hands on, I think that if you understand appeasement, people remain saying yes when their body is actually saying no. So I've learned to really slow down in my negotiations with people. And very commonly, I'm asking people, do you feel safe right now? And that might feel a strange question. They've paid for the session. They booked into it. They know me or they've got, you know, they booked me because they've had a recommendation. But still, in this new novel situation, this strange thing of being in a paid relationship, uh, their body's working much harder than they realize. So before I put my hand on, I've learned to help people. How's your heartbeat doing? 
How's some tension in your body? How's your breath? How's your belly? Are there any signs that your body's working a little bit harder than you realize in this particular novel challenging situation that you've chose to enter into? Are you really sure it feels safe? And I've learned that part of being trauma informed is to negotiate before I put my hands on a body worker to really help people realize there's all sorts of things going on in their body. And they may be saying yes, or maybe choosing to do something with their intellect, but that's a little bit disconnected from what their body's saying. And it might be good to realize they're a beautiful, calm swan on the outside, but underneath the legs are paddling like crazy. And it's good to acknowledge those paddling speedy qualities or the drifty qualities before we do body work. So I think that would be a good strategy for all masseurs or chiropractors, uh, yogis, is just to realize and help people know, how do I know that I feel safe? And not assume that's sort of given, even though people have made this gesture of stepping into the yoga class or stepping into the therapeutic situation. For me, trauma is the heart of what I do. Uh, stiffness and tightness was something I was trained a lot as, as a chiropractor. I did a lot of yoga, did a lot of massage, did a lot of shiatsu. The idea of changing tightness was really, really seen as important. But I learned things of stretching, manipulating, massaging local tissue structures to try and change tightness. I now believe that the most, the biggest thing that holds our body tight is a fear response. Or we lose control of our body, we have non-optimal tone in muscles because we're in a dissociated state. So until we help people come out of fight or flight or come out of freeze, we're going to do have not much effect on local tissue dynamics. The biggest predictor of stiffness or non-optimum muscle tone is being stuck in fight or flight or freeze. So all my work is helping people feel, feel, feel safe. Someone's shoulders really tight. I could spend weeks, months loosening the shoulder, adjusting the shoulder, but they go home and their brain says, you need to contract that, otherwise you're going to die, or the habit of overprotecting. Unless we help them feel safe to switch off, unless we're trauma-informed that this might have all sorts of layers of stories of being shouted at as a child, a difficult birth journey, uh, fear around getting old, all those layers of complexity need to be engaged with because it's much more than a tissue problem, it's a person problem and the person is stuck in protective reflexes and that affects every level of functioning. Just accessing via the tissues is not really that efficient way to work with tightness. We need to take on board that tightness emerges from fear experiences and becomes habitual protective gestures. So again, for me, I feel that's another example of how trauma has really radically changed my understanding of pain, tightness, stiffness, and structural dysfunction in the body. If we help people feel safe, then the body will be able to regulate, optimize, and frequently takes us out of pain states and states of tightness that don't need to be there when we feel safe. So yeah, I do that in two ways, helping people feel safe in their bodies. I use slow, gentle touch of cranial sacral therapy. Uh, I'm running two-year trainings, one in Galway in Ireland and one in London. Um, you need to kind of, those are in-person trainings and two-year trainings, but if you're at all interested in those, go visit uh, bodycollege.net and have a look around, around why touch is so powerful. That's actually gonna be the subject of my talk next month touch is really strange, looking much more in detail at the processes of touch and how we can negotiate touch even in uh, people who've been through horrible experiences of people doing things to their body. Because touch is actually problematic uh, often in talking treatment approaches to trauma. There's a touch taboo where we shouldn't touch. Well, I think we can absolutely negotiate touch, make that a safe process. And I think touch is a really, really powerful way um, of helping people find connection to their body again. We can move, we can get people to do feeling states in lead sessions where there's no touching, but it's much, much quicker to generate a sense of safety by using touch to help people to connect to their body. So yeah, I'll talk more about touch and touch is really strange in my next course, but 
Yeah, and if you really want to go into that, then we I teach two-year programs, cranial sacral therapy, uh, skillful, safe, relational touch that's deeply informed by some of the principles of trauma that I've just described. I also teach shaking. So uh, shaking, TRE, tension and trauma releasing exercises, another tool that I really like is one of those evolved mechanisms uh, of letting ourselves shake off tension. So I've got into a stress response, my diaphragm's tight, my neck's tight, my chest is tight, and I'm walking around, I've got all this armoring and guarding. So if we're not careful, all this stuff accumulates in the background, shaking's a really nice way of rebooting our body, shaking to release tension. There's also another nice metaphor in TRE of shaking to connect. So shaking generates new safe feelings of warmth and ease in our body. You can think of shaking as being in a rocking chair or being in a hammock. At that level, we're generating new sensations from this safe natural response of tremoring. But the focusing of the shaking is an anti-dissociative gesture of waking the body up. So yeah, shaking is a deeply, deeply trauma-informed model. And the idea that you can use slow, gentle relational touch that I model through cranial sacral therapy to help people come out of dissociative states to help them find safety and ease in their bodies. Uh, the TRE stuff you can do online. There's a, it's, it's a been amazing in lockdown to teach TRE to people online. Uh, so if you are in different parts of the world and you're interested in that, might need to negotiate the time zones, but uh, yeah, I've had people in Canada and people in India join some of the London zone time train uh, TRE trainings. Uh, so have a look out for those if you want to do a bit more online with me. Good. With this, uh, so training in cranial sacral therapy, does this include attachment trauma? What about pre and perinatal trauma? So yes, the early processes of bonding uh, and connecting may not be ideal. So I think that we learn safety by being received by another. We come out of the birth canal, we bond, we get soothed by our caregivers. Uh, so attachment processes are really, really important to understand. So we acknowledge the theory of attachment, but we model that through creating safe touch and rebooting things that might have been absent or lacking in early experience. Um, so the in relational touch, we, we believe that we can repattern early non-optimal experiences of attachment because attachment was really about being touched and received and stroked and held. That's where that fundamental bonding came through. Uh, pre and perinatal events. So that's a whole separate field to cranial sacral therapy. We acknowledge it, and it's a hugely influential in the field. Uh, I work in Switzerland uh, at a college called Dasein, where we teach two, three-year cranial courses there, actually. Uh, but the pre- and perinatal stuff is an extra two-year training. So to do justice to it, yeah, it's a whole paradigm. I don't teach the paradigm. I'm informed by it. And we'll give, we have a deep appreciation that uh, in uterine events, uh, the birth process and processes around birth are important to acknowledge in the journey of relational touch. And we'll teach you how to do that safely and some entry points into understanding pre and perinatal events as they're expressed through the shapes and gestures and rhythms and movements in your body. And that, yes, that we can still repattern those and acknowledge those and feel those and work with those uh, through with adults and help people come out of very, very early gestures that around pre and perinatal experiences. So yeah, part of the course, um, I hope, as I described, I hope that makes sense. Uh, no cranial sacral training online. It's just a face-to-face -face course. Really struggled in lockdown, I'm afraid. But uh, cranial works a touch paradigm. Just can't teach it online, I'm afraid. Yeah, self-touch uh, can work really well. So giving yourself a hug, putting your hand on your belly. Um, there's some really nice uh, philosophy that... Um, these soothing gestures we do to ourselves, just listening to our heartbeat, hand on our belly, we can actually feel more if we touch ourselves. So to just try without, try by just listening to your heartbeat, but putting a hand on, you'll get a bit more information. So yeah, bilateral touch, just squeezing your arms, self-touch, those are nice gestures that will help wake up your body and help you feel a bit more connected. So yeah, thank you, uh, Nicola, 
um, for reminding me about self-touch. Miriam, what would you advise to help someone break out of a vicious, vicious cycle of fight or flight and hyperarousal and then being so tired that it's the freeze dissociation? Yeah, well, first up, just to acknowledge, I think that's a very good explanation for why people um, vary between these two states. So one, the two elephants on the seesaw. So putting the elephants on a diet, I mean, that metaphor doesn't work so well, but we can cleverly swap to horses, to sheep, to dogs and cats on the, um, on the seesaw. Uh, you have to be quite uh, creative with your thinking around that metaphor. Another one is to understand that when we're overwhelmed is one from Peter Levine. Uh, in trauma, we have the accelerator full on and uh, we're going really fast in the car and then we slam the brakes on. When the accelerator full on, we're hypervigilant, it's all speed, 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 uh, might be angry or anxious and, and just really intense. And then we put the brakes on and we collapse, we play dead, we shut, we're more depressed, lethargic, we can't do things. So it's learning just to regulate. We don't take them both off at the same time because that's just awful. Two elephants stepping off the seesaw, things go crazy. Um, so it's slowly, slowly playing with the brakes, speeding up a bit, playing with the brakes, speeding up a bit, and just gently titrating that. Um, it's hard to describe in theory and maybe it doesn't make much sense, but by slowly learning to feel connected, we'll just... Um, take some of the charge out of the system. The Coke bottle model is really nice. There's all this energy in the bottle. If we take things off too quickly, we just get mess. The Coke just fizzes out everywhere. If we and come back next week and we just relieve little bits of pressure. So what I might encourage for what you asked about Miriam, about being stuck in vicious cycles and feeling out of control, is know that small things accumulate and feeling one, 2% better, feeling a little bit of connection to my belly, finding chatting with someone who you trust once or twice, just beginning to find those threads of connection and the small journeys of feeling safe, getting toeholds into those places. Uh, in our slow journeys, we've all learned about exponential graphs. So very slow progress of beginning to feel safe if we keep practicing, if we get support, we keep doubling, 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 and we'll get those exponential benefits. So if it feels impossible, do know that any small victories, if we keep practicing, we can breathe a little more, we can soften, soften a little bit more. There's certain times when I can feel a little bit safer, I'm around people, I can doing things that are a little bit more fun. Those lots of small victories, uh, if we follow the exponential model, can actually accumulate fairly quickly. Uh, but I don't promise easy answers here, just the theory and hopefully the practice and some clear thinking that bodies need to be included in the process and feeling states need to be negotiated somehow. Uh, but we can do that and we can regulate them. If it feels impossible on your own, uh, try some new tools. I'm offering TRE and touch, but uh, there's lots of other good tools out there. Good. Okay, folks. Well, I think I'm a bit talked out. Um, let me look at one. Pamela, I like your question. Dissociation in medical terminology versus dissociation in spiritual constructs. Any thoughts? Uh, well, yeah, no, gosh, loads of thoughts. Um, dissociation is a technical term uh, defined by the psychiatric profession. So they kind of owned it for a long time. Dissociative identity disorder. Um, and it was seen as a mental withdrawal, catatonic states as an extreme version of that, but a mental withdrawal that had consequences for what's happening with our body. However, animal researchers tended to use a different word, the freeze response. So they could observe that an animal collapses and its body was, was, was stuck and they were in this passive response. Porges and other people have united freeze from animal researchers with dissociation from psychiatrists under the construct of an immobilizing gesture. So immobilizing uh, has consequences for the body and has consequences for our mind. Good, but you're talking about spiritual. Yes. So um, this physiologically led gesture of disconnection and switching off changes our consciousness. 
we can't focus we don't know where we are but the weird part the hard part of that is it can feel amazing i do offer explicitly that what many people think are spiritual moments of leaving my body connecting being porous being open being outside of the body i think many people um are misinterpret a dissociative experience as a spiritual journey i think authentic spirituality is about including the body and it's a skillful process of of including more in your sphere of awareness now we may not we may go beyond the body and include more but the body is still available to us if we choose to return to it so i think authentic spirituality is including the body and is quite different has quite a different flavor uh, to the dissociation as an endorphin habit so i hope that speaks to your question a little bit but authentic spirituality authentic connection and heightened states of consciousness i think will always include the body to some extent or the body is available to return to um, easily and skillfully uh, and if you can't do that then i might be a little bit suspect that it's a little bit more of a dissociative endorphin state than might be useful Great, I've been doing another one next month. Touch is really strange. Have a poke around bodycollege.net. Some really great resources there, some things you can download. You can buy the books as well. And thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, be well, folks, and good luck uh, connecting to your bodies. <laughs>